Hey there, I'm Armin Shinza at Exin, and I welcome you to the Exin Talks. Exin Talks are a series of interactive webinars and talks during the Exin Week. These are conducted by professionals across a truly dizzying array of topics and of different types, from game development to the future in automation. With the constant interaction, it is a fantastic experience for everyone involved. To know the date and timings for the upcoming Exim Talks, please check out exim.co slash talks. Today with us, we have Ankit Vadva. Ankit Vadva is an Exim alumnus from the batch of 2000. He has co-founded multiple companies, including Rayo, an NFT collectibles company, and Vadi.com, one of the top-ranked e-commerce platforms in the UAE. He has been an integral part of our Exim event for the past few years. Without further ado, here is Ankit sir. Oh, hello. Hi guys, sorry, I hope you can see me clearly. Uh, there is, seems to be a little bit of trouble there. Let me just fix that. Okay, this looks much better. So apologies for that. But uh, thank you for having uh, me join one of your Exxon talks. I mean, uh, my association with Exxon goes a long way back to 1997 when I joined the club. Um, and participated in very exciting computer competitions, you know, representing the Delhi Public School Archipurum. So yes, the talks and actually all of Exxon brings back memories of the, the great times we had back in those days. Um, I was with the club and, uh, you know, kind of was the president with, with the, I think in 99, 2000, those were the years, but, uh, it's great to be back and great to talk to everyone. And today we'll be talking a little bit about something big that's happening in the field of computing, um, a big disruption that we are all seeing, um, probably the third major dis disruption of some of our lifetimes, second for the younger folks. Um, we will be talking about blockchain and possibilities that the blockchain revolution brings uh, to the table, NFTs in particular. Uh, my company, Radio, is a cricket NFT company. Um, which has partnered with several leagues and cricketing organizations as well as players. So the photos that you see behind me are our brand ambassadors, Rishabh Pant, Fab Tuklisi, Shakib Al Hassan, Smriti Mandana, Rashid Khan, Zahir Khan, and we are signing new people every day. In fact, most recently we signed um, uh, uh, Ruturaj Gaekwad, uh, Prithvi Shaw, Virinder Sehwag has just joined um, you know, our partnership as well. So with all of these cricketers, top cricketers in the world, as well as cricketing organizations, we are launching NFTs. And I, I'll, I'll use you know, what, uh, what we have learned over the last uh, two years of this business um, to share with you the possibilities and hopefully share some new perspectives on how the world is going to change yet again, just the way it has changed many times with every major technological revolution. So, with this, um, I just give me a minute, and we would I would love to start. But uh, before that, I just wanted to get a sense also from our host on what's the best way of getting audience questions. It would be great if you could activate that, and during the uh, during the session, or maybe even after uh, towards the end of it, if uh, you guys have any questions, anything in particular you would like me to focus on, please do share this. I'm sure our organizers will be able to flash it on the screen. And I'd love to address those. So coming back to our world and how it changes every time there is a major revolution. So I was born in the 80s, uh, 1983 to be precise. And in the 70s and 80s, we were going through um, the personal computing revolution, which democratized computing and brought uh, the power of what was otherwise limited only to the larger organizations with mainframes and supercomputers of those generation, uh, it brought it on every desk. And with that revolution, you know where we stand today, right? It's uh, us looking at very different economies, uh, businesses like Microsoft, um, Oracle, SAP, and several others, even Apple, were built primarily on top of that revolution that we saw in the 70s and 80s. In the 90s and 2000s and thereafter, uh, we've all gone through the internet revolution. Um, maybe I should not say we've all gone through. Some of uh, some of you 
may have been born after that revolution started. Um, some of you may have been born before. But what changed with the internet revolution was it brought us democratization of information. What that means is uh, information which was earlier limited to certain large organizations and powerhouses was now suddenly easily accessible across the globe. It basically created a channel with which you could get to the other side, which could be information, financial transactions, uh, very, very quickly and rapidly, which were big constraints in the lives before. Uh, so for, for instance, um, if, you, if you think about it back in the 90s, there were large consulting firms that would charge millions of dollars to get you information, um, to get large companies information about countries they want to expand to. And this information basically was a set of parameters like the GDP of that country, how it's growing, you know, which are the top sectors. I mean, all of this was worth a few million dollars in terms of project reports. And today is basically one Google search, which any of us can perform. So the second major revolution that happened in the 90s and 2000s democratized information. And we are living in a very different world as a consequence. I think some people also say the mobile revolution was another major revolution. I see it as a continuation of the information revolution, which has further democratized computing. I mean, brought the same information and access into our hands as opposed to our desks. Um, so it's in a way like an upgraded version or a phase two, which has brought us where we are. And some large companies that has come out of this revolution include the Amazons of the world, Google, Facebook. I mean, all the big companies that we look up to and uh, you know, and see as the stalwarts uh, of, of, of a new technology age came out of this internet and mobile revolution. Where we stand today with blockchain, yet another, um, yet, yet another feature which is limited to large organizations is being democratized. This large feature is trust authenticity and verifiability. Today, we place our trust in large organizations, whether those are governments, <clears throat> and you would go to a government to verify whether a piece of land belongs to a particular individual or a particular organization, or it is large private organizations. And I think we've all done this. We've all placed our trust in organizations, for instance, like Google. Um, I mean, I'm very certain almost all of us would have used Google login on various websites. And we somehow place our trust in Google to say that, look, if Google is ident identifying the user as me, then they will not defraud me. They are not going to, you know, get um, Rishabh Pant identified as Ankit Wadwa and give him access to all my accounts. Uh, but they would, if they are identifying someone as Ankit Wadwa, it is Ankit Wadwa. So we place our trust in a large organization like Google, in large organizations like governments, and several other such examples. And the reason we do this is because, uh, um, I mean, they have too much to lose if they get it wrong. Like if, if a Google was to wrongly identify me, I mean, they have a very large organization to lose. And it is the fact that they have too much to lose, which gives us comfort that, yes, we can place our trust in this large organization. The same is the case with the governments. I mean, some people sometimes uh, would say that, hey, I don't trust my government, etc. But you know, if there is one institution that we trust the most today. It is our administrative setup and our governments, uh, because a large part of what we do on a daily basis depends on our trust and verifiability uh, by a government organization, whether it's your passport, whether it is the fact that you own certain property um, or your identity. Uh, a lot of that is verified by the government. And the reason we all place our trust is, again, governments and every large organization has too much to lose. If they purposefully were, were wrongly identifying an individual, the whole system would collapse. So trust has been the domain of large organizations. And now with blockchains coming in and several businesses being built on top of that, beginning with currency businesses, going further to DeFi businesses or distributed finance organization businesses, going further into NFT businesses, which are related to um, collectibles or digital goods. And very soon, 
what you may also call as DAO or a distributed autonomous organization, which is essentially policy businesses or policy functions, which can be moved to the blockchain. A lot of this is being enabled by the fact that blockchains fundamentally provide the concept of ownership, uh, the concept of verifiability, and that is provided as a layer. Yeah. So, so basically, so far, the biz businesses have not been cut in this manner where this entire foundation layer of trust becomes sort of a large infrastructure piece that we all use and we build our businesses on top. So businesses were building the entire stack on their own. And a key feature of any form of de democratization or revolution in the, in the tech and computing world has been, uh, you know, whenever one layer has been sort of taken out and built in a certain manner that innovators like you, like several other people in the world, are able to then leverage the benefits of this layer and say, you know what, I'm going to build this new interesting business on top. Now, what you're seeing with NFTs <clears throat> and what we are building at Radio um, is the ability for cricket fans. And believe me, there are lots of cricket fans in the world. There are more than 250 crores uh, cricket fans in, in the world, 2.5 billion cricket fans. That's a very large number. That's two times the population uh, of India. And Unfortunately, these fans have not had a stronger way of connecting with the sport like some of the American sports have or even football uh, globally does. One third of revenue generated by any sport typically goes towards non-broadcast, non-marketing non fields like memorabilia, jerseys, collectibles. Uh, that has not happened in cricket so far. And we believe uh, a large part of the reason why that has not happened is because uh, um, I mean, actually, for a couple of reasons. The reason you and I don't buy jerseys as much for cricket as maybe we buy, buy for football clubs uh, is because of, one, the issue of piracy, and two, um, actually, the fact that many of us don't really care about a product being pirated because you really can't tell the difference between you know the original and the pirated one. So if uh, the official jersey of Team India comes out for 3,000 rupees, uh, a copied version would be available in... Uh, Sarojini Nagar in Delhi for 500 or 800 rupees, which looks pretty much the same and honestly not very easy to tell any tell the difference. So of course, what happens? I mean, people prefer the pirated option. Now, when you look at the the NFT world, in the NFT world, um, two things happen. Number one, you can have limited quantities of products, right? So if there's a particular card and let's say a digital version of that card is being made, so a card which looks somewhat like the Rashid Khan card that I have behind me, this is officially licensed by Rashid Khan. And let's say only 50 copies of this card are produced and put out in the population. There can be only 50 copies, right? So number one feature that blockchain provides is it provides the element of scarcity, the ability to create digital goods in a certain limited quantity. And number two is verifiability. Verifiability of the fact that, you know, this card, if say you bought the Rashid Khan card, then the fact that you are one of the 50 people who actually own this, uh, and the fact that this is actually a true and genuine card uh, is something that is guaranteed by the blockchain because you can actually, I mean, essentially what is a blockchain, right? The blockchain is basically a large public ledger with accounts on top of it that anybody can read. So you can actually see if a Rashid Khan card is owned by me, then, then, then that card has been bought by me from, let's say, a person X who bought it from a person Y, all the way up to the source, and you actually know who issued the card because all that data is publicly available, verifiable. Um, and as a consequence, you know that this cannot be pirated. So one of the two issues, which is piracy, is addressed um, you know, by the fact that this is a business that's on the blockchain. The second issue is related to pricing, and we are value conscious people in the subcontinent, uh, which also happens to be the, uh, the the sort of center of the ticket world. So, I think what the what digital goods like NFTs, like the cards that I talked about, provide is the ability to launch cards at a price of one dollar or at a price of $1 million, depending on the scarcity aspects and requirement and other aspects, 
uh, which help people bridge the sort of price and value barrier and say that, you know what, I really care about my cricket. I really care about, uh, you know, Virender Sehwal, uh, who's my hero, and I'm a big fan, but I don't have a million dollars to buy that one collectible that he issued as an NFT, but somebody in another part of the world has those million more dollars and that person is able to buy it. But I can spend a couple of dollars, I can spend a couple of hundred rupees to, uh, to essentially own a collectible which represents my fandom. And because these are digital products, we have the flexibility of pricing uh, at various price points which work uh, for the cricketing uh, fan base and audience. I mean, essentially, we are leveraging the fact that blockchains have provided the ability to trust, verify, uh, see the, a true chain of authenticity on a particular good that we own, that an individual owns, and take that into a business which was historically run as a physical business. Look, uh, I mean, uh, trading cards have been in business for a very, very long time. Um, it's a $15 billion industry in, in the US. Uh, largely led by the US, it's also in Europe and several other parts of the world. But it has never really come to cricket because of the factors that I described. I mean, we are essentially using the trust and verifiability of the blockchain to enable the same feature set in the digital space for fans. So now we are in a world where if you were a fan of Virendra Sehwag and, where, you know, they, by the way, he does have 2.2 uh, million cricket, actually 22 million followers just on Twitter. Uh, if you combine all the platforms, it could be much more. So these 2.2 crore people who follow him just on digital platforms, I mean, some of those uh, some of those fans and followers are, um, are, are, I mean, would do anything to have association with their hero. And if their hero comes out with 50 artifacts, 50 cards, uh, which are issued officially by him, and if there are only 50 of those, I mean, those 2.2 crore fans would be very excited to get their hands on this. And essentially, when you when you think about business from this standpoint, I mean, you've got an entire new class of businesses that are possible, which were so far not possible because trust, verifiability, scarcity um, are dimensions that were not available and monetizable before the new revolution started. Um, all I can say is this is where we are starting. We, we believe uh, this revolution is um, essentially going to move in the direction of disrupting some fields uh, which are closest to the digital economies, to digital worlds. Um, sports is one of those. It has always been close uh, to the digital world. I think video games and gaming as an industry is another one where the aspect of verifiable ownership of certain assets outside of the world gardens of the games uh, will be enabled by NFTs and is being enabled by NFTs. There's not a single gaming company in the world right now that is not thinking of non-fungible tokens um, as a core part of their strategy. So gaming, um, digital media, which includes entertainment, so music, um, you know, movies, uh, Bollywood, etc. cetera. Um, and, and as you look further, I mean, several other se sectors I can think of, uh, you know, are close to the digital space. Financial services, one which DeFi is already kind of disrupting um, I would even say academia is a very big sector that possibly is going to look at disruption coming from NFTs and uh, law and several others. Uh, I think uh, we've taken a start. We said, okay, you know, here is a new revolution that is available to us, a new way of doing things. Um, you know, we've used that to say that cricket can be disrupted and a new form of cricket is possible, where a new form of fandom is possible, where fans can associate with their heroes. Um, in, in ways which were not possible before this. And I'm sure smart people in the audience today um, and generations of entrepreneurs that will come up will be able to create many, many new businesses that we possibly are not even able to think of today. But essentially, I mean, I want to close this session uh, by saying, look, we are in yet another tech revolution. We were in one in the 70s and 80s. And look what happened. Look at Microsoft, uh, look at Oracle, look at SAP, look at several other companies like Apple that came out of that. The second major revolution happened and look at Amazon, look at Google, look at Facebook and several other companies that came out of that. I mean, we are sitting at the third major revolution and interestingly, a few things are different this time. This time we are in, we are in a sweet spot um, 
of being in a geography which is not a laggard, right? We are we are in a country which can which can and is already leading from the front uh, when it comes to this revolution. Um, we are also not a laggard anymore in terms of experience. I mean, look at the number of businesses that have been built. Uh, India has had the highest number of unicorns coming out of its economy in 2021, which was last year. Um, so clearly, we have a lot of intellectual potential and capital. Uh, we have a lot of talent capital. Um, I think there is a lot of capital in the market also backing this intellectual intellectual capital and talent capital. I mean, and uh, we have a great future with a lot of smart kids who are participating in the exit events this year and watching possibly this show, as well as in uh, you know a part of schools. I mean, you guys will be building the future. But essentially, I mean, I would love to look at this video five years from now and say, yes, we spotted the revolution early. The world is going to change yet again. Trust and authority is getting democratized, just the way information and computing was democratized in the previous revolutions. And this time, India's time has come. You will see a lot more companies, a lot more businesses coming out of our geography. And uh, I hope many, many such businesses are also created, uh, you know, by the fantastic kids who are watching this uh, this this talk today. That would be all from my side, and I'm uh, uh, I'm excited to have you know take your questions, answer them if there are any, if there's a possibility of doing that as a part of this talk. Uh, alternatively, you can always write to me separately. Um, my email ID is my first name, which is Ankit, and after the ad sign, just put in uh, the name on top, which is radio, and then a dot com. So it's ankit at radio.com. If you have any questions, if you'd like to catch up, if you'd like to talk about blockchain, NFTs, and how that's changing the world, or if you're excited about cricket, I mean, reach out. Would love to have a chat with interested people. Would be, you know, it would be great to talk, guide, um, discuss um, anything that you would be of, you would find of interest in this space. All right, that's everything from my side. Um, Bhuvnesh, um, if there are any questions, we can uh, pop them on the screen. If not, then we can take this to closure. Oh, actually, they are. Okay. So, Sumesh, um, I mean, I think interoperability is a word which is uh, sometimes misused. Look, fundam the fundamental of uh, technologies that are built with the blockchain are. The f is the fact that your assets are interoperable. So when I talk about trading cards, when I talk about you know the, uh, the kind of cards that we produce, um, these cards will be useful in various games in the cricket metaverses, right? But you could use the same if you let's say you own the Rishabh Pant card uh, in your wallet on the blockchain, and that was the NFT that you own. Then you could take this card into one game where you're playing with Rishabh Pant, some, something that is similar to a Trump cards of yesteryears. In another game, you could take this and play fantasy cricket. And you could take the same card into a third game and, uh, game and play virtual simulated cricket. So interoperability is actually a core feature of blockchain technologies as well as businesses. The fact that I'm not playing just a game, I'm actually owning an asset, which is the Rishabh Pant card which becomes even more valuable to me because it's sort of like a plug or a key that I take to one game, plug it in here and start playing with the features that come in the card. Uh, and the features are not just, by the way, mind you, are not just limited to the image. I mean, there's a lot of data and data models behind each of these cards. And, you know, those data models represent uh, the characteristics of the player. Uh, I mean, these are multidimensional cubes, typically, that would talk about, you know, the biomechanical skills of the player as well as performance factors and everything that it could be useful in, you know, kind of giving this player a form and function within the games that you're that you're playing with the player's uh, card. So interoperability um, is the direction in which we are all moving. It is for sure going to be one of the most important features of the blockchain and blockchain businesses uh, that will make our lives very exciting and start get, get us to start thinking about. Um, you know, factors in, in, a, in a way that we haven't so far. I mean, for us, everything was about a game and owning digital goods within the game. For the first time, you actually are not thinking of the game. You're thinking about the asset that you have, and you can take it between various apps and games, groom your asset, 
and uh, you know when you think that you've groomed it enough you might want to sell it off in the marketplace and maybe just do this entire process uh, for making money as well uh, so yes the answer is it's not just important this is a core feature of blockchain businesses and the blockchain and it's not just about carrying your digital art you're carrying your digital asset right and art might just be the cover of that asset the beauty functionality and features of your art are actually in the data that is stored behind the cover in the same asset and it's not across just layer one but it's basically interoperability is on the same chain or across chain in both cases it is it's a feature it's not just a question of importance it's a core part i hope i was able to answer that question for me Okay, Somesh, Somesh has more questions. Um, so thoughts on usability of NFTs beyond collector items. How do you see then decentralized and sandbox playing a role here? I mean, uh, okay, so a lot of interest in the NFT space has been because of the value it generates. And there are three dimensions to value of an NFT. Uh, number one is uh, most of the NFTs that you've seen so far have been digital forms of art. So essentially, the the image that goes on top is one dimension which gives value to the NFT. So if it's an image that a lot of people are excited by, um, so you know it's um, the fact that um, uh, so so the image plays a part. Number two is because this is a business on the blockchain. Um, um, so essentially, scarcity plays a part, and number three is. The fact that uh, you know NFTs can be used on various apps and games, so utility plays a part. So the three dimensions are the value of the asset, or the value of the image, or whatever is the cover. Uh, number two is scarcity. Number three is utility. I mean, I think a lot of businesses that are built and NFTs that are gaining value are basically because of the first two dimensions today, which is the fact that they are limited in quantity, which is scarcity, as well as you know whatever is the creative that goes on top. May be exciting, may not be exciting, but it's definitely something that people. Are looking at and saying that hey, I want this. So it's basically the first two parameters which are driving value of NFTs. But my prediction is, uh, in the near term to, to medium as well as long term, you will see the utility dimension growing uh, at the fastest pace, and the other two becoming less and less relevant. Um, yes, of course, you know the entire collector item approach is the first major um, segment that has been. Uh, sort of taken up by NFTs, but subsequently utility is bound to become uh, the biggest piece of the space. I think, uh, and, and that's sort of in sync with scale as well, right? It's utility that scales. Scarcity, by definition, does not scale, and not every piece of art or every piece of uh, media can be as exciting as every other piece. So that is also something that doesn't scale. So you are going to see scale in this business, and you know, in NFTs in general, coming more from utility than the other two dimensions. Kavin, that's a very good question. Um, okay, let me think of a PG thirteen way of answering this um, because the example I've typically used um, is not. Look, these are two very very different things. Cryptocurrencies are the virtual world equivalents of money and nfts are the virtual world equivalents of goods so they are as similar as uh, the cash that you may have in your wallet and the poster that you may have on your wall or as different as those two are right actually the, the only feature that's common to both of them is the fact that they're both offshoots of the blockchain technology uh, I mean, if you were to use the same equivalents, uh, you would say email and calendar are the same thing because they are both, you know, um, part of the Google suite, which is not the case. I mean, if you were, were to say that, people would only say that, hey, you've lost your mind, you've been stupid. Um, how can calendar and email be the same same set? Uh, I mean, it's the same thing. Uh, unfortunately, we are in early days of evolution. Actually, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but the fact is that we are in early days of evolution of a particular technology. And consequently, people do tend to confuse things without understanding them. So because everything sounds the same, I mean, it's 
it's like saying that you know everything blockchain nft crypto DeFi, um you know DAOs. oh this is this must be all the same this is all cryptocurrency i mean this is just the way your great grandfather would have said yeah you know everything is the internet and but you know all of us know um for the better that not everything can have the same color uh, there are nuances and these are not even nuances these are just major differences i mean one is goods one is currency it's two different things two different worlds isn't for example a signed cap by rishabh pant also something that holds exclusivity but it doesn't have the same value in the market that nfts have at the moment i mean i don't know whether it does not have the same value in the market um i think we'll have to step out into the market to see that but if i were to assume that was the case it would be because you know nfts have an advantage of scale i mean they're similar in terms of scarcity but they have the advantage of being a lot more discoverable and tradable i mean uh, i don't know do you know would you know where you can find that signed cap by rishabh pant uh, do you know who has it do you know how to get to that person uh, do you know how to actually execute a transaction there you could be a person sitting in australia who's a big fan of rishabh pant or maybe not even a fan maybe just a trader who wants to buy it from whoever currently owns that cap and sell it to the next fan who wants to pay a lot of money for it but you're sitting in australia I mean, how are you going to figure out where this cap is sitting right now? So you get to it and then you buy it and then you trade it up uh, to somebody who's a collector and wants to own this. And how does this collector find the cap? I mean, the market today is has several, several hurdles and that um, automatically would mean there is a price to be paid. Every hurdle reduces the value that can be extracted from a particular asset. I mean, when you look at NFTs, um, we have taken this physical world concept and converted it completely um, into something that can be accessed by anybody from anywhere in the world, right? And just this pure access, the fact that there is this access and the second thing is also just verifiability. I mean, if you get a Rishabh Pant cap, how do you know it's actually Rishabh Pant's cap and it's been signed by him? I have seen personally and a lot of cricketers have also revealed in the conversations that we have for partnerships. And there have been instances, you know, where a particular cricketer would visit someone and, uh, you know, and the gentleman on the other side is like, hey, you know what, I have this prize possession, which is a signed bat that you had signed in this at this time in this year. I mean, and the cricketer, uh, I remember who mentioned this, told me that he um, just did not say anything, smiled and said, that's amazing and left because he knew he had not signed that bat. Yeah, but he didn't want to break, uh, break this poor guy's heart. Um, so verifiability is a big, big deal. And in the physical world, verifiability is hard. Like if you get the signed Rishabh Pant cap, I mean, honestly, are you going to take it to Rishabh Pant to ask him, did you really sign this and would he remember? But when it's an NFT, the verifiability is guaranteed because you can actually trace everything on the blockchain. It's a public ledger. It's an open ledger. You actually know who issued it and whether that was through an official partnership and subsequently who's owned it till the point that you are actually making the purchase. So both verifiability as well as access to the asset are significantly stronger for NFTs. And I can imagine if what you're saying is the case where the physical asset does not hold the same amount of value as the NFT, it could be because these two dimensions completely change how you would look at a collectible asset. Ariman, uh, how do you establish the legitimacy of a new NFT collection? I'm not fully certain what you mean by legitimacy. I mean, uh, NFT collections are launched. Um, so NFTs are nothing but instances of a class, right? It's a, uh, or actually even pointers to instances of a class. Um, the class is what kind of defines who's the owner of the, and the class is a smart contract, right? The owner of the smart contract is the one who would be issuing the NFT. And the question now is, is the owner trustable and reliable and legitimate? And I think that's the aspect that typically that's the, that's a border that's crossed uh, with legal documentation as well as uh, public representation. In our case, when I talk about the players who are um, 
our partners, and they have more than 20 partners now globally, and five cricket leagues. Um, each of these has an official partnership that has been declared uh, publicly by both sides uh, on Twitter, in news, and we have contracts, um, you know, that that give us the exclusive ability to generate NFTs from their assets. Right. So, um, I, th I think the question is. How do you establish the legitimacy? I mean, if an NFT collection about cricket stars uh, talks about people we've signed up, it must be coming from the radio smart contract. As long as it is coming from the radio smart contract, it is covered by, uh, I mean, the legitimate use that we are authorized for the IP that we have. And uh, I think I think there is one leg of verifiability where somebody would need to check that okay, this is coming from radio, and radio also does have authority to publish this. I mean, typically, this would be available in the public domain that, uh, yes, radio does have the authority. At some point of time in future, people might start putting this into the smart contracts. It's not the norm today, but you might just want to put a, you know, some reference uh, to your, like maybe, you know, when, when actual legal contracts move into the blockchain world and smart contracts are kept on the blockchain, maybe you will start having pointers from one NFT to another saying that, hey, look at this contract. This is what authorizes us to have this. Um, but today, yes, you have to rely a little bit on traditional media, uh, of official announcements, uh, which are, I mean, which, which, which add the element of trust and legitimacy. What do you think of all the NFT scams going around? I mean, uh, it would be great, Ashwin, if you could also, I don't know if there's a way to get a part two of your question, but uh, which scams are you talking about? Is There are several levels of scams. Um, fake NFTs could be one scam. Uh, I mean, somebody stealing somebody else's NFTs from their wallet could be another scam. And, uh, and, and, and many more of the likes. I think... Uh, as long as you're buying your NFT uh, from an NFT issuer who's verified, um, you've kind of prevented scam number one, which is, you know, somebody else using the same image and saying, hey, I'm going to produce an NFT and just sell it because it's an NFT. It could be a pirated NFT as well. Look, it's verifiable. The beauty about the blockchain is you can verify who made what and whether that person has the official rights to do that or not. Right. Um, if something is verifiable, it also means people need to verify, right? Um, and user experiences need to provide provide an easy form of verification. So, for instance, if there is an NFT with any of our players, I mean, I think any any person who's purchasing should just do a quick check on the issuer of the NFT. I mean, it's super easy, right? When you actually are on EtherScan or Polygon Scan or any of these trackers, it just says there which which smart contract has issued the NFT. If it says radio, that's perfectly fine. If it doesn't say radio, it's not fine, right? So, I mean, wherever there are going to be businesses and business ideas, there are going to be scams. It's uh, a feature of the human race. Um, and I don't think any of us can avoid that. Uh, but, you know, some of these scams right now that, that we typically hear about are basically, um, you know, scammers tapping into essentially the newbie segment uh, that is not as careful or just is getting in and does not understand even you know, has a little bit, bit of a uh, while to go before they understand the basics well. So, for example, I mean, it's as simple as saying, please don't give your password to anyone. If someone asks for a password and they say they will, you know, you will, if, because Elon Musk is giving away like a million Bitcoins. And if you give your password, the private key is your password for your wallet. If you, if you give your password, your private key to the wallet and copy paste it in on a website, because, you know, you could get some of the millions of bitcoins that Elon Musk was going, going, giving away. I mean, this is an obvious scam and you're falling for something that you should have never done. It's as good as saying that if someone says, hey, sign here and you just go and sign. I mean, that's not a smart move. So a lot of scams that are going around right now are unfortunately because this is a new technology. And I think some basics are just forming on how we need to behave in this ecosystem. Um, the fact that you should never, never, never share your private key. And unfortunately, unlike passwords, private keys cannot be changed, right? So if you, your private key has leaked out in some way, the only option you have, and by the way, just 
wallets on the blockchain are basically public private key pairs right so public key is what would identify your wallet and private key is what you have with yourself which allows transactions on your identifier but you never share your private key because anybody can just empty out your wallet if you do and because these pairs are essentially pairs that cannot be segregated so you cannot have a new password either so if you want a new key then you create a new wallet move all your money to that or currency or nfts and then basically give up on the old one yeah so what do you think of all the scams going around i mean any new technology will bring scams and uh, i think it's it's great if people can read up a little bit and get themselves used to the basics like don't share your password i think that would prevent a lot of what's happening today how's art stored on the blockchain if it's stored on a centralized server and not an ipfs then the nft has no fundamental value at all if it's if the set server goes down uh you assume that an nft is just the art being digitized right i mean uh, an nft is an instance of a class it's, it's an it's an object and an object is a collection of data and functions right uh, the art on in that object is just one piece of data because it's an image file and an image file could be is data just like any any other um data that any computing system would hold or any uh, object would hold um so an nft actually is that entire unit of which the image is one part yeah so first of all what you own is that nft you are not owning the image of the art image is, is a part of the package that you own so i mean it's impo- i i hope i'm able to explain this but i mean the beauty of nfts is that the value goes beyond just the cover i mean the image is like a cover to the nft the value is in the rest of the data and functions that are there and just imagine like rishabh pant's data and functions which enable you to play like rishabh pant in a fifa like cricket game that would be beautiful and that's what nfts that we are creating allow people to do so the beauty of this new technology i mean it's very easy to dismiss a new technology and say oh this does not hold value i mean it's just this is craziness right this is just a digital form i mean this is art put into an nft and suddenly the whole world is going crazy everybody's lost their mind i mean when, whenever you believe everybody has lost their mind you're probably missing something right and the beauty of what we are looking at in the new world here is these digital assets i mean again i'm saying this again the image in most cases that you will see in the future is going to be just a cover to the nft right so the first part answering your question aryaman i mean it's not just the art it's the token you own the token art is a part of that package right so important to get that distinction in our heads it's uh, sort of is the fundamental of what nfts provide for the future and why there is excitement why we are building these businesses right and why i believe that you know hundreds and thousands of entrepreneurs will build even more businesses right because these tokens essentially create the fundamentals of digital goods yeah so we'll talk about that maybe at a separate time but to your question if it is stored in a centralized server yes you could lose the art yes you could but do you really believe that art is going to be stored on one central server and not have any copy anywhere else in the world i mean do you think that the nft that you own is so exclusive that only one server one place one location is the only place i mean what what happened to cdns all of a sudden right so yes i mean in an ideal case you would want even the image data to be stored on the blockchain but blockchains are not capable of handling that quantity or volume of data as of today i mean for sure technologies will evolve and therefore people keep the images on a separate sort of a storage system which could be centralized or ipfs and by the way why do you need to have something on a centralized server when it can be on an ipfs system like all our imagery is kept on ipfs ipfs is immutable so once an image is actually put up on ipfs it will stay within the interplanetary file system so i mean i would not say that there is no fundamental value first of all because a it depends on what the nft is and whether it's an art nft which has no other value because it's it was always representing only the art but if it is not an art nft then the art could be just a cover 
I mean, honestly, how many times have you lost the cover to your book? Did the book book lose value? Possibly not. I mean, I remember my, in my school days, we used to have like copies and books where the cover would even tear apart. But we would still carry it and we would get the same knowledge from it. So, I mean, it's a matter of perspective. Um, yes, and, and honestly, like I think NFT creators uh, should keep the media files that they want as a part of the NFT on the IPFS. And to be honest, even the IPFS is not like, the right answer is you would want all the data together in the token. I mean, but that's just an expensive way and a very slow way. It's not, it's not that straightforward. So yes, there are some constraints to the technology, but smart people are also building and solving various aspects of this ecosystem. And you will see more iterations coming down the line. So ingenious crab. That's an interesting name, or maybe it's an auto-generated one put up by uh, by the studio tool that you're using here. So NFTs were originally made to provide digital artists value for their art and the effort they put into it. But now a lot of low effort, overpriced NFTs are on the market. How can this be fixed? Um, they were not originally made to provide digital artists value for their art. I mean, that's it. I don't know what else to say. Like it's a uh, um, NFTs are objects of classes. Objects have several sets of data. It's a collection of data and functions. I mean, there have been several examples like CryptoKitties, which uh, uh, which was done by Dapper Labs that did beautifully well. I mean, it's not about digital art or artists' value. I think this is just one of the use cases, right? And how people use various use cases, uh, honestly, this is an open market. You don't need to fix anything, right? And if some, what do you mean? Like, I don't, I don't understand what you mean by overpriced NFTs. If it's selling at that price, then it's not overpriced. Someone wanted to buy it at that price, right? I mean, if it's low effort and high price, like it's an, it's a free open market. Uh, that's the beauty of it, right? If you create an asset or a piece of art, you want to convert it into an NFT, and that's the format of NFT you want to use. And then you you know, put it up for, let's say, you know, $10,000, and someone buys it for 10000 then it is not overpriced. It is priced right because it cleared the market, right? There is a bid. There is an ask. Overpriced products, overpriced products do not clear the market. They don't sell. They will auto-correct downwards to the point where they're actually selling. You know, otherwise, you will not be able to sell it. So, I mean, I don't... Uh, that's the answer, right? Like it's an open market. It will fix itself. I mean, if there is something that is overpriced, it is not going to sell. If it's selling, it is probably priced right or it's underpriced. I mean, Ashwin, I think, uh, look, we need, we need to move beyond the skepticism, man. Uh, I think, uh, Try to internalize the fact that why is this happening? Has the whole world gone crazy? Are we living in a time where we were so disillusioned that everything that we see, everything that we do is so surreal and unreal? Are people who, who currently have a lot of assets and money that stupid that they just want to throw it away everywhere? It's hyperinflationary. It's crazy. Why is this happening? I mean, maybe a part of what you're saying is true. And there are some people like that. But that cannot be the phenomena for the human race. Or for everybody who's made, you know, who's who's in the space, right? I mean, if that has really happened, I think we are all doomed, right? And then we should not be talking about innovation and creating fresh new worlds. I mean, I think we should be talking about Armageddon and how we should prevent ourselves from going into that direction. I don't think that is happening. I think there are the the, the craze, the hyperinflation, as you call it, is because today a large population does not recognize the value of the revolution that we are seeing, right? How our worlds are going to change. These are the first few computers when, you know, like the IBMs of the world, I can't even remember the exact number, but I, I remember IBM itself had projected that total sales of PCs will be some absolutely new low number. I mean, because in their minds, PCs had very specific use cases. They were not supposed to be in every desk in the world, right? So at that time, I mean, similar thoughts would have been there. But now if you think about it, people, some, you know, some people are looking at things in a very different way. 
They're saying NFTs are a part of a new revolution, a new way of doing things. The world is going to look very different in three to five years when this becomes a part of everyone's everyday life, right? And then if you own the first few NFTs that ever came out, just purely on collectible value, purely on collectible value, how much would you pay for it? It's just like saying that, you know, the Apple II did not sell too well, but if you own an Apple II and you still have it, how much is it worth? So it's all a question of perspective, Ashwin. I think we can take a very cynical perspective and say, you know, certain things have no objective value. Or we can take a perspective where we are saying that, look, things can be and will be valued a lot more because there are certain factors at play. And many times what happens is these factors are there for all of us to see, but not everybody is able to. And I think it's, I mean, I think it will just reveal itself with time, right? So, yeah, I, I would say it's not, uh, the, it's not about the art. It is also about the value, the scarcity, and it's a combination of both. And, and I mean, just think about it from this perspective. I think, uh, I think you will see that the value I mean, okay, so so I I think I've, I've hopefully answered the question. Taxation and regulation, should people have to pay capital gains when they sell their digital art by auction into stable coins? So, Samesh, that's a good question. Um, and uh, um, I mean, governments need tax revenue uh, to operate. That's what pays everyone's salaries. That's what pays for our roads to be built. That's what pays for everything that we benefit from. And NFTs are a class of digital assets. And if they are being bought and sold, they are absolutely going to be subject to regulation and taxation. Um, the, do these regulations exist? Do taxes exist? They already do exist. I mean, if you buy NFTs from someone who's selling it to you, there is an implication of both GST as well as uh, equalization, I mean, there are, so I, I, let me not talk for the experts on taxation. Um, I mean, of course, taxes should be applicable. And I think there are enough categories of taxes that have already been defined, which may need some clarification on how they should address NFTs, because there are some peculiarities of the asset that we are talking about. I mean, here's an asset that can cross boundaries and borders very easily. So, so, so really the question that comes up is um, how that should be looked at in context of the tax regulations that are already there. Um, I think you raised a good point on stable coins. Um, I mean, the treatment for cryptocurrencies in most parts of the world is also, in some parts of the world, is also similar to goods. So if you were selling an NFT to get cryptocurrency, it's more of a barter trade where you've given one good and taken one more. Uh, the treatment of stable coins, however, is... Um, is more similar or is similar to currency because they're backed by currencies, right? So at that point of time, I mean, uh, when you when you ex exit your money into stable coins, maybe that's when capital gains apply. But I would leave this for the tax authorities to kind of refine their existing regulations to account for, you know, nuances and intricacies that are brought in by this new class of assets. Um, but fundamentally, they are still assets. They are goods, and we have already created a large frameworks of re regulation. I think which absolutely apply to NFTs or any other class, just like any other class. Yes, of course, some some changes, some regulation will be needed to tweak these and suit the category. The trump cards are a cover for the NFT. Where does the value lie? I mean, uh, the value is of any asset is in the desire for a buyer to pay for it. Yeah. If you own something that I'm willing to pay, let's say $100,000 for, the value of that thing is $100,000, unless what you're holding is currency, which has a defined value. Right, and that, that goes back to a question that someone had asked earlier, how do you 
look, I mean, how are cryptocurrencies different from NFTs, right? So if you hold, um, I mean, sort of, if I look at the poster right next to where, uh, sorry, I can't see it very clearly, but there seems to be a movie poster next to where you're standing in your profile image. Um, if you own that poster and I want to pay 10,000 rupees to buy that poster off you and you're okay with that price, the value of this poster is 10,000 rupees. Right, so the value of an asset, just like every other asset in the world, and anybody in the markets, you know, in the markets and in any sort of a trading business, will tell you, the value is the same as the clearing price of an object, yeah, or an or a good or an item. So, yeah, I think it's not about trump cards. It's not about, I mean, the image is a cover, for sure, but the value is in. The value associated or with the asset between the buyer and the seller. Now, if there is an NFT that I'm using, uh, let's say for a particular purpose, there's a game called Z Run. Yeah, Z Run is basically a horse racing game where every horse is an NFT, and these are not even images. These are like 3D renders of horses and very sort of basic quality 3D renders. So there's no imagery there. There's no trump card like thing there. Where is the value in that horse? Is it because the blue colored line was used versus the green colored line to make that 3D model of the horse? Maybe to an extent that is possible. But I, the bigger source of value is in the utility of that horse. That when you own that horse and you go and participate in races, does the horse win? Right? The second source of value is if you take that horse into a separate app which allows breeding of horses. So your horse, somebody else's horse, and you create, you know, a new horse who has fine lineage, you know, and a great pedigree, but all of this is happening in the virtual world. You're essentially breeding and grooming horses. And these are the NFTs. So where is the value coming from? The value is not coming from any image on the horse. The value is coming from the utility of that horse. And again, I, I, I would refrain from just giving my answer on this. A lot of the value comes from the trade. So the buyer and the seller mutually are deciding what is the value that they want to ascribe to this asset, right? So, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end that question by going back to the metric I talked about in between. When you talk about NFTs, or digital goods and maybe the same thing applies to any goods there are three axes or dimensions of value i mean it's a vector it's not a scalar right so it has three dimensions to it one is the quality of the image so uh, to your point it is I mean, the quality of the image the value that a buyer would ascribe to the art or whatever is the media on top uh, it might not be media either, but whatever it is that you know, your visual connection, the cover uh, with the NFT, that's one dimension of value. The second dimension of value is from its limited quantity or scarcity, right? So if there's only one quantity of something, so, so the demand for the art is high, there is only one quantity, that's value. Both dimensions are adding value. And there is a third dimension, which adds what I would call scarcity value. Uh, sorry, utility value. So how can I use this NFT? Can I use this horse in horse racing, right? I mean, the net value of the NFT is a combination of all three dimensions. Yeah, and then what ratio the three dimensions add up together? What's the function that kind of creates value as an outcome and input of these three dimensions? I mean, will vary depending on the asset class and the type of NFT. Yeah, uh, so I hope I'm able to explain or give some clarity on the question that you had. Uh, the value is not, I mean, there is value to the asset for sure, the image for sure, the scarcity as well as utility. So it's a multi-dimensional problem, not just one dimension. Uh, thank you, sir, for such an amazing talk. Uh, I found it very insightful and I hope our audience did too. Uh, thanks for joining in and I hope you all enjoyed the session. See you at the next excellent talk. All right, thank you so much.